Okay, I'm back. Ah, we are going to, or I am going to, provide a lecture tonight on Macbeth, Act 1, Scenes 4, 5, 6, and 7. I believe I can get all four scenes in within a, an hour period. So we, again, I'm using Sparks Notes, No Fear Shakespeare, the No Fear Translation. And we're moving on now to scene four. This is the scene where Macbeth and Banquo are greeted by Duncan. Um, it's also the scene we learn how the Thane of Cotter died and how his death parallels in opposition to Macbeth. And that Cotter was the traitor who then died a man... Um, penitent and regained all of his loyalty in his death, which appears to be the exact opposite now happens to Macbeth. He, who is a man of great loyalty, now that he has attained the Thane of Cotter's title, he is turning traitorous. So it's almost as if the title of Thane of Cotter is a um, bad omen for anyone. This is another scene that really presents fair as foul and foul as fair because Duncan, his character, his tragic flaw is his inability to distinguish when a man is truly loyal to him and when a man claims to be loyal but is in fact a traitor and is deceiving him. Is execution done on Cotter? Are not those in commission yet returned? My liege, they are not yet come back, but I have spoke with one that saw him die who did report that very frankly he confessed his treasons, implored your highness's pardon, and sent forth a deep repentance. Nothing in his life became him like the leaving it. He died as one that had been studied in his death to throw away the dearest thing he owned as twere a careless trifle. There is no art to find the mind's construction in the face. He was a gentleman on whom I built an absolute trust. Enter Macbeth, Banquo, Ross, and Angus. Oh, worthiest cousin! The sin of my ingratitude even now weighs heavy on me. Thou art so far before that swiftest wing of recompense is slow to overtake thee, which thou hadst deserved that proportion both of thanks and payment might have been mine. Only I have left to say, more is thy due than more than all can pay. The service and the loyalty I owe in doing it pays itself. Your Highness's part is to receive our duties, and our duties are to your throne and state children and servants, which do but what they should by doing everything safe toward your love and honor. Welcome thither. I have begun to plant thee and will labor to make thee full of growing. Noble Banquo. Thou hast no less deserved, nor must be known, no less to have done so. Let me enfold thee, and hold thee to my heart. There, if I grow, the harvest is your own. My plenteous joys, wanton in fullness, seek to hide themselves in drops of sorrow. Sons, kinsmen, thanes, and you whose places are the nearest know, we will establish our estate upon our eldest Malcolm, who we name hereafter the Prince of Cumberland, which honor must not unaccompanied invest him only, but signs of nobleness like stars shall shine on all deservers. To Macbeth, from hence to Enverness, and bind us to you further. <laughs> the rest is labor, which is not used for you. 
I'll be myself the harbinger and make joyful the hearing of my wife with your approach. So humbly take my leave. My worthy Cawdor. The Prince of Cumberland. That is a step on which I must fall down or else or leap, for in my way it lies. Stars, hide your fires. Let not light see my black and deep desires. The eye wink at the hand, yet let that be which the eye fears when it is done to see. <laughs> True worthy Banquo, he is so, he is full, so valiant, and in his commendations I am fed. It is a banquet to me. Let us after him, whose care is gone before to bid us welcome. It is a peerless kinsman. So as I said, this is riddled with appearance versus reality. It opens with that very theme when um, Duncan comments about the Thane of Cotter, who has been put to death, and how he himself, Duncan, is not able to distinguish loyalty from traitors, deception from truth, with the way in which a man presents himself. A man will present himself as loyal and caring and supportive, and he will embrace that, not recognizing that hidden beneath that veil is a traitor, which was the Thane of Cotter. But as Malcolm told us, when the Thane of Cotter died, just before he died, Malcolm had learned that he had confessed his treasons. He implored his highness's pardon, begged for forgiveness, set forth a deep repentance, expressed his sorrow for what he had done, and his death, as a result, allowed the man to regain dignity. So, the Thane of Cotter, who was traitorous prior to his death, after having lost his title, regains some semblance of his nobility, his, his honor, his dignity by confessing, begging pardon, and expressing great sorrow. That same title is now given to Macbeth. And in the previous scene, we saw Macbeth thinking, considering the concept of murder. Now again, everyone's opinion of Macbeth, a worthy cousin who has done so much that there's no way the king feels he can ever pay. Macbeth, in quite a very flowery language, says that um, you don't owe me any money. Um, my service, all the payment that I get for my service is in my doing service for you which is nice and flowery, and Duncan cannot see the contradiction within Macbeth and how he is thinking about the possibility of killing him. Banquo is represented as being of equal value and worth to Macbeth. And we saw his importance in scene two, or rather scene three with the witches, and there we saw the witches hailing him as the father of kings. Lesser than Macbeth, the greater thou shalt not, thou shalt get kings, though thou shalt not be one. Something to that effect. He, Banquo, is not flowery. He does not go on and on, as Macbeth did, to prove himself loyal and honest. He just simply says, if I grow, the harvest is yours. Everything I am, I give to you. Now... Duncan, the king, moves to business, and he establishes his estate upon his eldest son, Malcolm, who he names the Prince of Cumberland. Traditionally, the Prince of Cumberland was the next in line for the throne. Now, this is important to know that during this time, the king leadership 
wasn't essentially hereditary, but he makes it hereditary by giving it to his eldest son. Now, of course, Macbeth has a comment on that, but he can't give his aside until after he has spoken with the king. The king, oh, sets himself up. We know Macbeth is considering the possibility of murdering the king. He hasn't made up his mind, but he now just learned that mm, the king is giving the throne to his own son and not to the man who truly deserves it. And he sets himself up, Duncan, by basically inviting himself over to the Macbeths for a night. So, from hence to Enverness, and bind us further to you. So, we're going to go to your place, we're going to spend the night, we're going to party, you're going to feed me, yada, yada, yada. So, Macbeth wins the war for him. Macbeth receives no payment for everything he's done. Macbeth watches as the king gives the future crown, the future throne, to his son, who he does not necessarily, who has not been shown, as Macbeth has, as the great warrior worthy and deserving of the throne. And then he invites himself to Macbeth's house. Perfect. Now we get Macbeth's thoughts. Here in this very short aside, the Prince of Cumberland, that is a step on which I must fall down or else or leap. It's a lovely little metaphor. I'm going to trip and fall or I step over him. I either have to do something about Malcolm becoming the next king, the fact that Malcolm is now Prince of Cumberland and not me, I have to do something about that. Or I do nothing and all my ambitions, all my hopes and my dreams that have been stirred in me by the witches are gone. Here, we really get a strong sense that he is much more inclined to kill the king, where he speaks to the stars in the sky, the night scars, the night stars to hide their fires because he does not want the black and deep desires, his thoughts, his dark, deep thoughts and desires to be known. The eye wink at the hand and so that nobody can see what will happen, the murder of Duncan. And of course, it ends on such lovely dramatic irony where Bank Duncan continues to praise Macbeth to Banquo. And we just heard Macbeth say, I have to do something about this and call to the heavens to have a dark night so that nobody will see him killing Duncan. That is dramatic irony. We know Macbeth's true desire and intent. And here Duncan is once again giving full, utter trust to a man who is going to deceive him and be a traitor. Scene five. Lady Macbeth, what a beautiful character. Oh my God, she is so, she is, she is a very strong woman. Shakespeare loved strong women. He made strong women who were heroines and he made strong women who were villains. And Lady Macbeth is that strong villainous woman. She and Macbeth love each other dearly. And it is evident in this scene because of the way in which he addresses her in the letter and the fact that he writes her to tell her this news so that she, his dearest partner in greatness, does not waste a moment being able to rejoice in what will be his and, by extension, hers. But she also knows him. She knows him extremely well and knows that if this man is ever going to become king, he has to take action. He has to do an unforgivable act. And the only way he's going to do that is if she bullies him into it. And she intends to bully him into it. So, beginning with the letter that Macbeth has written to his wife, 
They met me in the day of success, and I have learned by the perfectest report they have more in them than mortal knowledge. When I burned in desire to question them further, they made themselves into air. They made themselves air into which they vanished. Whilst I stood wrapped in the wonder of it came missives from the king who all hailed me Thane of Cawdor, by which title before these weird sisters saluted me and referred me to the coming on of time with Hail, King, that shalt be. This have I thought to good to deliver thee, my dearest partner of greatness, that thou mightst not lose the dues of rejoicing by being ignorant of what greatness is promised thee. Lay it to thy heart. And farewell. Oh, glams thou art and God, and shalt be what thou art promised. Yet I do fear thy nature. It is too full of the milk of human kindness to catch the nearest way. Oh, thou wouldst be great, art not without ambition. But without the illness should attend it. But thou wouldst highly, thou wouldst wholly, wouldst not play false, and yet wouldst strongly win. Thou wouldst have great gloms that which cries, Thus thou must do if thou have it, and that which rather thou dost fear to do than wisest should be undone. Oh, I thee hither that. I may pull my spirits into thine ear and chastise with the valor of my tongue all that impedes thee from the golden round which fate and metaphysical aid doth seem to have thee crowned with all. Enter the servant. What is your tidings? The king comes here tonight. Thou art mad to say it. Is not thy master with him who, wert so, would have informed for preparation? So please you, it is true, our thane is coming. One of my fellows had the speed of him who, almost dead for breath, had scarcely more than would make up his message. Oh, give him tending. He brings great news. The raven himself is horse that croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. Come, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here and fill me from the crown to toe top full of direst cruelty. Make thick my blood, stop up the access and passage to remorse that no compunctious visitings of nature shake my fell purpose, nor keep peace between the effect and it. Come to my woman's breasts and take my milk for gall, you murdering ministers, wherever in your sightless substances you wait on nature's mischief. Come thick night, and pall thee in the dunnest smoke of hell, that my keen knife sees not the wound it makes. Nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark to cry, Hold! Hold! Enter Macbeth. Great glove. Worthy Cotter, greater than both, by all hail hereafter. Thy letters have transported me beyond this ignorant present, and I feel now the future in the instant. My dearest love, Duncan comes here tonight, and when goes hence? Tomorrow, as he purposes. Oh, oh, never shall sun that morrow see. Your face, my thane, is as a book where men may read strange matters. 
to beguile the time, look like the time. They're welcome in your eye, your hand, your tongue. Look like the innocent flower. The bees, the serpent under it. He that's coming must be provided for, and you shall put this night's great business into my dispatch, which shall to all our nights and days to come give solely sovereign sway and masterdom. We will speak further, only look clear to alter favor ever is to fear. Leave all the rest to me. So as you see, Lady Macbeth receives word from her husband. And as Macbeth had designed, she is ecstatic with the news. He refers to her as his dearest partner of greatness. He sends her the letter so that she might not lose a moment of joy in knowing what their future is to be like. And she is determined. You will be king shalt be what thou art promised. But there is a rub, and that rub is his nature. Too full of the milk of human kindness. He's a nice guy. Oh, God, I married a nice man. Fortunately, that nice man has ambition. But he lacks the evil qualities necessary. He wants to be great but he wants to be holy. He does not want to play false, <laughs> but I know damn well that he would take anything wrongly gained. Oh. He's afraid, though. Hide thee hither. She is now in an apostrophe, speaking to her husband, get home, get home now, that I may pour my spirit in thine ear, so that I can, in fact, talk you into this, chastise, scold you with the valor of my tongue, keep you from everything that is stopping you, impeding you from becoming king, from getting that crown. And she is definite that he is going to have that crown. Fate and metaphysical aid has crowned him. When the servant enters, he brings great news. He comes to tell her that Duncan is arriving at the castle that night. And um, she turns vicious. She refers to the raven, the raven, a bird of death. Think Edgar Allan Poe. The raven, he cries out, to give warning of a man's death. <laughs> and he is croaking. <gasps> he is croaking himself hoarse, crying out the impending death of Duncan, the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. <sighs> but I must be strong, she says. She calls to the evil spirits, spirits that tend on mortal thoughts. I saw a wonderful production with Judy Dench, and um, of course I saw the film version of the stage production, but oh my God, she put her hand towards the floor, she bent down, she was speaking directly to the powers of hell. Fill me, unsex me. Take away my femininity because, of course, women were the weaker sex. We're still, in many ways, deemed the weaker sex. Um, and so she says, all my femininity, strip it from me. I want to be filled from the toes all the way to the top of my head. Toe top full from the crown all the way down to the tips of my toes with direst cruelty. She doesn't want to have any remorse. No compunctious visitings of nature, no desires as a woman to not go through with this. She goes so far as to say, my breasts, which have milk for a baby, I want you to turn that into vinegar, gall, 
What did they give Christ on the cross when he asked for water, something to drink? They soaked it in vinegar. Then she calls to night, just as her husband did. She wants a dark night so that her keen knife would not see the wound it makes. She, like Macbeth, the call for darkness to hide their upcoming cry so that not even heaven will see what is happening. And then enters her husband. The woman is in ecstasy. She sees him as great gloms, as a worthy cotter, but greater than both because he is to become king. And this is one of my favorite lines. Thy letters have transported me beyond this ignorant present. And I feel now the future in the instant. It is as if by reading his letter, she has entered into the realm as queen already. Again, their loving greetings. He tells her the news. She asks when he leaves. He tells her tomorrow. And she says, ha, not likely. Never shall son that morrow see. Well, he'll go to bed tonight, but he'll not wake up to see the sun rise. Now Macbeth sees his wife speaking boldly and clearly everything he's been thinking. He hasn't had the balls to even say it out loud to himself. It's been in his thoughts. When he's doing the aside, when he's doing the soliloquy, yes, he's speaking aloud, but he's speaking aloud for the sake of an audience. She says it straight up, and he's shocked. There is our stage direction. Your face, my thane, is as a book where men may read Strange Man. It's written all over your face, even Duncan well, maybe not Duncan, because he sure as hell can't tell the difference. But anyone who looks at you can tell you're guilty of something. Now we get that lovely appearance versus reality. Her advice to him. To beguile the time. To fool the time. Look like the time. You have to pretend you still love and respect this man and would die for him on the battlefield. You bear welcome in your eye and your hand and your tongue. Ah, welcome, welcome. We love you. Oh, we're so happy to have you. Yada, yada, yada. Bull shite. Look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent that will bite and kill you with poisonous fangs. She says, I'll take care of everything. And he says, okay, we're, we're going to talk about this again. He's not committed. And she says, oh, 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 look up clear. To alter favor ever is to fear. In other words, you don't go through with this with me. You're a coward. Scene six is a short little scene. It's an incredibly condensed rich scene of dramatic irony. Dramatic irony, of course, we know more than the character involved. We know Macbeth and Lady Macbeth have been plotting murder. We know that Lady Macbeth has every intention of seeing Duncan dead before the night is over. He will not wake up to see the sun rising. Duncan believes that he is being welcomed into the home of one of his most loyal generals who loves and honors and respects and serves him. And in the previous scene, when Lady Macbeth said to her husband, look like the time, bear welcome in your eye, your heart, your tongue. That's exactly what she does in this scene. There's some lovely symbolism in this scene too, with the martlet. In the previous scene, the raven, the harbinger of death. In this scene, the martlet that nests in the God's house in churches. Ergo, a bird that is symbolic of God. Goodness. This castle hath a pleasant seat. The air nimbly and sweetly recommends itself unto our gentle senses. The guest, this guest of Sumber, 
but Temple Hartling Martlet does approve. By his loved masonry that the heaven's breath smells wooingly here. No jutty frieze, buttress, nor coinage of vantage, but this bird hath made his pendant bed and procreant cradle. Where they most breed and haunt, I have observed, the air is delicate. Enter Lady Macbeth. See, our honored hostess, the love that follows us sometime is our trouble, which we still we thank as love. Herein, herein I teach you how you shall bid God's ill for us your pains, and thank us for your trouble. All our service, and every point twice done, and then double done. We're poor, we're poor in single business to contend against these honors deep and broad wherewith your majesty loads our house for those of old and the like dignities heaped up to them. We rest your hermits. Where's the Thane of Cawdor? We cursed him at the heels and had a purpose to be his purveyor, but he rides well, and his great love, sharp as his spur, hath halt him to his home before us. Fair and noble hostess, we are your guests tonight. Your servants ever have theirs themselves and what is theirs in compt to make their audit at your highness's pleasure, still to return your own. Give me your hand, conduct me to mine host. We love him highly and shall continue our graces towards him. By your leave, hostess. So there you have it, Duncan arrives, sees the castle, sees how beautiful it is, smelling the sweetness of the air. Even Banquo, who was there at the presence of the prophecies, agrees that this is an incredible home, that, that everything about it is sweet and inviting. And the fact that the martlet has made its home there is evidence of it, because it normally is in buildings with frieze, buttress, coin of vantage, etc., ergo churches. Um, every place that these birds have made their home, the air is sweet, the air is delicate. When Lady Macbeth enters, as I said, look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under. Oh, she is just that. Duncan says, I'm sorry that our coming is going to cause you so much pain, but still we love you and wish to spend time with you. And she's like, we are going to do everything twice over again. And then again, after that, two times more if we have to. And we open up everything to your servants so that your stay is the best. And I am only sorry that we do not have enough. Our wealth is not great enough to bring all the dignities that we need to to present to you. Duncan then asks about Macbeth, the Thane of Cawdor, and he comments about how Macbeth had raced ahead of them and how they tried to catch up with him, but it was impossible. Of course, we know why he raced ahead. He couldn't wait to get home to talk to his wife. When, ironically, he arrived to speak to her, he sort of <coughs> clammed up. Here we are your guests tonight. <laughs> oh, yes, you are. Here she says your servants can help themselves to everything in order to make your stay the best. And she's won his heart. Give me your hand. Take me to Macbeth. We love him highly. He is a man on whom I based an absolute trust. There's no art to judge face and what is truly in the heart. And we do have, this is still under an hour. I don't want these lectures to go over an hour, but we have our last scene. And in this last scene, Macbeth has left the party. They're all in the other room, drinking and laughing and having a great time but Macbeth has gotten up from the table and walked away. And he is on his own, and he is pondering this whole 
saying he's debating why he would kill Duncan. He lists reasons why he should not kill him. He lists that he would do it if it was possible to avoid any consequences, but he knows better. And then his wife enters. He tells her at the end of his, that he is not going through with this, that he's not going to murder his king, and she lets him have it. Holy dynamite. She tramples over him like a, a, a stampede of raging buffalo, and he, a frog, in the midst of it. If it were done when tis done, then twere well it were done quickly. If the assassination could trammel up the consequence and catch with his Circe success, that but this blow might be the all and the end all here. But here upon this bank and shoal of time, we jump the life to come. But in these cases, we still have judgment here that we but teach with bloody instruction, which being taught to return to plague the inventor. This even-handed justice commends the ingredients of our poison chalice to our own lips. He's here in double trust. First, as I am his kinsman and his subject, strong both against the deed. Then, as his host, who should against his murder shut the door, not bear the knife myself. Besides, this Duncan hath borne his faculty so meek, has been so clear in his great office that his virtues will plead like angels, trumpet-tongued, the deep damnation of his taking off. And pity, like a newborn babe, striding the blast, or heaven's cherubim's horse upon the sightless couriers of the air, shall blow the horrid deed in every eye that tears shall drown the wind. Mm. I have no spur to prick the sides of my intent, but only vaulting ambition, which o'erleaps itself and falls on the other. Enter Lady Macbeth. How now, what news? He hath almost supped. Why have you left the chamber? Hath he asked for me? Know you not he has? <clears throat> we will proceed no further in this business. He hath honored me of late, and I have bought golden opinions from all sorts of people, which would be worn now in their newest gloss, not cast aside so soon. Was the hope drunk wherein you dressed yourself? <laughs> has it slipped since? And wakes it now to look so green and pale at what it did so freely. From this time, such I account thy love. Art thou afeard to be in thine own act and valor as thou art in desire? Wouldst thou have that which thou esteemest the ornament of life, and live a coward? In thine own esteem, letting I bear not wait upon I would like the poor cat in the adage. Prithee, peace. I dare do all that may become a man. Who dares do more is none. What beast was it then that made you break this enterprise to me? When you durst do it, then you were a man. And to be more than what you were, you would be so much more the man. Nor time nor place did then adhere, and yet you would make both. They have made themselves, and that their fitness now does unmake you. I have given suck, and know how tender tis to love the babe that milks me. I would. Well, it was smiling in my face, have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out, had I so sworn as you have done to this.
if we should fail. We fail? But screw your courage to the sticking place and we'll not fail. When Duncan is asleep, where to the rather shall his day's hard journey soundly invite him, his two chamberlains will I with wine and wassail so convinced that memory, the warder of the brain, shall be a fume and the receipt of reason a limbic only, when in swinish sleep their drenched nature lies as in a death. What cannot you and I perform upon the unguarded Duncan? What not put upon his spongy officers who shall bear the guilt of our great quell? <gasps> Bring forth men, children only, for thy undaunted metal should compose nothing but males. Will it not be received when we have marked with blood those sleepy two of his own chamber and use their very daggers? They have done it. Who dares receive it other? As we shall make our grief's clamor roar upon his death. I am settled and bend up each corporal agent to this terrible feat. Away and mock the time with fairest show. False face must hide what the false heart does know. So, Act 1, as I mentioned earlier, opens. If I could do it and get it done and not suffer the consequences, boom, it would happen. But in these cares, we still have judgment. Blood will have blood in essence. And I have no reason to kill him. I, I shouldn't kill him. First of all, I'm his kinsman and his subject. I should be protecting. I should be strong against the deed. And then I'm his host. And I should be protecting him from the murderer. And thirdly, most importantly, Duncan has been a great king. And his role as king, his death, an act of against nature would cause all of nature to cry out. And then I only have one reason. Ambition. A lovely metaphor. Vaulting ambition which overleaps itself and falls on the other. Now the lady enters. And he tells her, <coughs> we will proceed no further in this business. I've gained a lot of praise. I am high in his esteem. Why would I want to throw that away? And she is pissed. She asked him if he was drunk when he made the promise to her. She says he's green and pale. She says that from this point forth, will I decide whether, determine whether or not you truly love me. She calls him a coward. And then she says, you would be a man. An even greater man when you are king. Oh, and then she takes it one step further. I'm more of a man than you are. I have given suck. I've breastfed my child. I would take that same child while it was feeding on my nipple, smiling up at me. I would take it and smash his brains out before I broke my promise to you. Macbeth is like, oh, wow. What if we fail? And she's like, we're not going to fail. Not if you screw your courage to the sticking place. Screw your courage in there, buddy. She's got a plan. When Duncan is asleep, she's going to get his chamberlains, his guards, drunk. And when they're asleep in a drunken stupor, they can do whatever they want to Duncan. And they will put, they will frame his spongy officers. They're going to frame Duncan's guards. Oh, wow. He's married one hell of a powerful woman. And in the previous scene, when she said to, when she turned and, and vowed and called on the evil spirits to unsex her, he says, you have been unsexed in essence. 
bring forth men children only for thy undaunted metal should compose nothing but males you're as strong as any man out there stronger maybe even and he recognizes that those two who are sleeping in his chamber will be framed everyone will think it was them because they will mark them with blood and they will use their daggers And Lady Macbeth says, we are going to, nobody's going to question us because we're going to be weeping and wailing over Duncan's death. Well, that's it. She's, she's steamrolled over him. He's as flat as a pancake. He has no manhood. She's got it all. He agrees to murder Duncan. I unsettled and bent each corporal agent to this terrible feat. Now the act ends as the act opened with that appearance versus reality theme, that motif. And it's also the same more or less advice Lady Macbeth gave to him, look to, to the gal the time, look like the time, um, be the innocent flower, look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. He is telling her the exact same thing. Away and mock the time with fairest show. False face must hide what false heart no. And that, of course, is why Duncan cannot distinguish between an honest man and a deceitful lying man. Woohoo! I got the act done. Okay, everybody. I will be posting Act 2 shortly.